Let's pray. Father, uh, today we do uh, look forward, God, to what you're going to show us individually. God, how you're gonna work in our hearts. God, how you're gonna change us. And, and Lord, we look forward to what you're gonna do corporately for this body, this thing we call Calvary Sierra Vista. Lord, we wanna, we wanna honor you as a group. And so God, we know that that starts with each and every individual. So speak to us, guide us, direct us, encourage us, convict us. Lord, we wanna grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We wanna grow in our understanding of you and our understanding of us and our understanding of this world we live in. So I do pray, Lord, that you would bless this time. God, that you would have your way, but most importantly, God, that we would be people who are changed because we came. And we thank you, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, as we uh, get ready to uh, finish this chapter, uh, several people have asked me to kind of do a chronology of the end times because I've mentioned what certain parts are uh, but necess haven't necessarily put a chronology together. People have asked me to do that, give them, a, you know, what we call eschatology and kind of lay that out and give some scripture references. So we're going we're gonna to spend a little bit of time this morning before we get into the passage looking at that. And if you're bored, just go to sleep. I'll wake you up at the end and, and uh, you can kind of get back involved when we're involved in the passage. But uh, hey, I think it's important. Listen, I don't think it's something we should fight over and argue over and get bitter about, but I think it's important that we understand things. I think we should have a, a, a view, vision, a view of end times, make our own decisions what's going on, and, and listen, we need to look at things. It's scripture, and you know, hey, one-fourth of the Bible is prophecy, so it should be something that we're concerned about. So I'm going to give you, you know, the way I see it. You know, it's going to come from, as I said before, a pre-mill, pre-trib, dispensational kind of theology. And I'm going to get, you don't have to agree with me, but I'll give you the chronology. I'll give you the scriptures why. And then, hey, you can write some of this down. And some of the scriptures are going to go fast. So you, you might want to take a picture of the screen as we do it because uh, I, I got to get through all of this. And I'm seeing if I can wear out the interpreter's fingers as as we go and see if she can keep up. So, so uh, hey, as we do this, though, I do want us to think about the most important thing. Jesus is coming back. That I'm not going to budge on. He's coming back. And so, hey, I'm only doing this because I want us to be ready. So, beginning here, I believe right now we are living in what's called the church age. And the church age is kind of a mystery. If you study the Old Testament, there's nothing about the church in it. And listen carefully, do not replace the church and Israel. Israel's Israel, the church is church. And the Bible says, even in the New Testament, that we're a mystery. This whole thing about the church, we're that, we're that blank between the 69th uh, uh, week of Daniel and the 70th week, we're that little blank in there, and that's the age we're in. So we're in the church age. I believe it began in Acts chapter 2 at Pentecost. Others believe it began on the cross. That's okay, you know, but at the age we're in, either at the cross or Acts chapter 2. Now, the next event that I see on the world scene coming is what I refer to as the rapture of the church. Church. The church taken up to meet the Lord. I don't think anything has to happen before that occurs. I don't think there's something else that must happen. And I believe, again, coming out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, talks about the rapture of the church and the catching away is what it's called there. And then, second, I put 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 in there because of this. Some people say, you know what, I'll just wait till the tribulation. And then when it gets really bad, then, then I can get saved. Hey, according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you reject the truth now, chances are you're not going to believe the truth then. I used to be real dogmatic and say you won't. And I encourage you again, read that passage and find out. So we have the rapture of the church. Now, immediately after the rapture of the church, I believe the next event is the judgment seat of Christ. That's where believers will be judged. And, you know, I, I like what uh, Don Stewart says. It's really not a judgment. It's more of a reward ceremony. When we come to the judgment seat of Christ, we're going we're gonna to get rewards for what we've done. And uh, it may be a little 
judgment for some who haven't done anything, but you know, you may not look forward to that. But hey, we come before the Lord according to Romans chapter 14 and 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we come to the Bema seat of Christ right after we're raptured, before we uh, go to what I think is the married supper of the Lamb. So then, after that, after the church is raptured, the church is going through the judgment seat, I think then we come to that thing called the 70th week of Daniel. And the 70th week of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. And that's what I call the tribulation. And it's a period, listen, it's a period of seven years. And in that seven years, God's wrath is going to be poured out. And God is going to judge the, all of the sin of the world. You know, sometimes people tell me, man, is God ever going to judge things? Yeah, he is. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad he's patient. I'm sure glad he was patient with me. I'm glad he was, you know, long-suffering with me. Hey, I did some things and said some things I should have never gotten saved if God wasn't that patient and that faithful. So we have that and the tribulation then. We can talk about Matthew chapter 24, 1 Thessalonians 5, Revelation 4 through 19 kind of explain the tribulation, but in the middle of the tribulation is when things turn bad. The tribulation begins when the Antichrist makes a covenant with Israel, and then in the middle of that seven-year covenant, he breaks the covenant and things get more intense. But if you read the first half, it's no picnic. You know, some people go, well, I don't think the first half's that bad. Really? Read it and see what happens and tell me it's not that bad. So listen, man, it intensifies some, and uh, you can read those passages and look at it. Satan, in my mind, Satan is just unleashed, and he can do whatever he wants during that time. And again, God is unleashing him, and God is allowing that. So we have that going on, and uh, then at the end of that time is when Satan gathers the world. They come together, and they battle against God. The Antichrist is in He's bringing everything together. That's Revelation chapter 16. And they come and they have this, quote, battle against God, the battle of Armageddon. Uh, I think that's kind of a misnomer. It's not going to be a huge battle. Listen, Jesus is not going to come back and go, man, hope I can make it through this. When Jesus shows up, it's over. It's not a battle for him, but it's a battle for the world. The world gathers against God, and then Jesus comes, the second coming of Jesus, then in in, uh, Revelation 19, Matthew 24, he comes and he begins to set up his kingdom. So Jesus comes, puts his foot on the Mount of Olives. You know, it's cut in two. You have a whole uh, different thing going on there with the Dead Sea. All of that begins to happen. And then at that same time, is Matthew chapter 25, what we're going to read today, is the judgment of the nations. So at the end of the tribulation, the judgment of the nations, and all of those who have accepted the Lord, the believers at that time will go into what we call the millennium, the millennial kingdom, enter his kingdom. All of those who have not rejected him go to judgment. So Jesus comes and people go into the millennium as people. We will come and rule and reign with him, but we will have glorified bodies, the church. When I say we, I mean the church. We'll have glorified bodies, but others will enter in just regular. And they're gonna go in, they're gonna procreate, they're gonna have children, but they're gonna go in as believers. Jesus is gonna rule and reign. The Bible says that Satan will be bound for a thousand years. And again, do you, if you ever read that, again, for homework, read read. Uh, uh, some of those passages there in Matthew 25 and, and uh, uh, especially though back to Romans 19, Satan is bound for a thousand years. And when you read that, one angel binds him in a pit for a thousand. When people tell me, man, God is locked in this battle with Satan. One angel, one angel comes and says, hey, in the hole, dude. Wraps him up and bounds him up. So he's bound for a thousand years. Jesus then sets up his millennial kingdom and Isaiah 11 30, and Isaiah 35, Revelation chapter 20. And some people argue, listen, some people say, oh, this whole millennial idea has only been around for the last 200 years. Not true. Read some of the church fathers. Hey, if you're somebody today, you know what? I, I, when I first got saved, you couldn't get a hold of material. Now today, just Google church fathers and start reading some of their writings. 
And it's amazing what, you know, what the church, these guys, and when I say church fathers, I'm talking about the guys who were alive in the second century and third century, and they're writing books, and they're, they're making declarations. Listen, the whole thing about the millennial changing and being spiritualized, that all started when Origen started spiritualizing texts and started saying, this represents this, and this represents that, and started allegorizing, and the Bible got all messed up. Before that, People simply read the Bible and believed it. How novel. So again, that's the millennial reign of Jesus. Now at the end of that time, Satan is going to be released. He's going to come out of that hole and he's going to deceive the world. And here's what blows my mind. And every time I like to emphasize this, those people will live for a thousand years with a perfect ruler, a perfect king, Jesus They will enter into a perfect world set up by him. They will have parents who are believers. No one goes into the millennium who's not a believer. And they will be raised, I believe, in in that atmosphere. Yet, at the end of that time, in Revelation 20 and 21, Satan will come and sweep away millions of people to follow him and come against God. Don't tell me that our environment is what causes us to do bad things. What causes us to do bad things is our heart. And so, man, they rebel against God. Then you have that that one final, uh, 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 you have the final rebellion. You have God bringing that rebellion to an end. And then you have what's called the great white throne judgment where everyone will be judged. And you and I need to know something. Every sin that has ever been committed will be judged. If you're a believer, your sin is judged on the cross of Jesus Christ. But you need to know something, no sin goes unjudged. Every sin is judged. And so if you're in Christ, hey, it's judged on the cross. If you're not, you're gonna get judged for that sin. Great white throne happens and then, and then after that time, we go into what we call eternity. And again, Revelation 20 and 21. And we go into eternity with God forever and ever, a new heaven, a new earth. So that's, that's the way I see things playing out. That's my chart. Those are some scriptures to back it up. Now, I do want to talk a little bit about the millennium because there's a whole bunch of people who do not believe in the thousand-year reign of Christ. They say it's really not gonna happen that he's reigning now and he's reigning from heaven and uh, you know that's what the thousand years are all about. They spiritualize it as I, as I kind of alluded to earlier and they say, hey, it's just something, you know, it's something you don't have to worry about it. And here's what I'm thinking. God made some promises and some of those promises are that the Messiah would sit on the throne of David and he would rule and reign in Israel, the Messiah's never done that. Jesus has not done that. So uh, I'm gonna bring up five things why I think the millennial is real and the millennial is really gonna happen and starting with these promises and here's a bunch, Isaiah chapter nine, chapter 54, uh, chapter 66, Jeremiah chapter 23, 31, 33, and Romans 11. All of those talk about he is going to come and set up his kingdom and have a kingdom. And listen carefully, man. The, well, I'll, let me get to the next, the next slide. So we have those promises. God keeps his promises. Oh, and here's one, Matthew chapter 19. Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 told the apostles they would sit and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. How are they gonna judge the 12 tribes of Israel if he's not ruling and reigning? And then, the one that I kinda wanted to get to, here's all of these, dealing with Jesus' first coming. When Jesus came the first time, was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Do you believe he was gonna be born in Bethlehem or do you think that's spiritualized? And on and on we can go, all of those were literal literal prophecies fulfilled literally, then I believe the second coming has to be literal and I believe we have an enemy 
of our souls that is trying to deceive us into not believing those things because, hey, if he can keep Jesus off of that throne, then God doesn't keep his promise and his word, and that makes God out a liar. So there's that one. Then we have also uh, the one in Romans chapter 28. It's the only way, or I'm sorry, Romans chapter 8. There's not 28 chapters. Romans 8, 21 through uh, 22. Where This is the only way G Jesus is going to demonstrate he's the ruler of the world. And he's gonna come and set that up. And then I believe that this kingdom that we're talking about, this millennial reign, is the bridge from this world to eternity. So I hope that, I hope that kind of helped some who needed it. And those of you who fell asleep, wake up. Let's say that loud. Come back, come back. And now we're gonna look at some things. We're gonna look at, we're gonna look at this 25. And I hope part of it, I wanted to lay a foundation for chapter 25. And especially this section we're looking at, this is the judgment of the nations. A lot of people interpret this and say, it is the great white throne judgment. No, it's not. Listen carefully. This judgment takes place at the end of the tribulation. This judgment takes place, and these people here he's talking about have lived through the tribulation. Some have accepted Jesus. I believe, listen, I believe the greatest revival the world has ever seen will happen during that seven-year period. I believe a whole bunch of them are going to be killed and dead, but I believe, again, a whole bunch are going to go through the end, and Israel is going to come through. So we're talking about the end of the tribulation. Keep that in mind. We're talking about when Jesus comes to set up his throne, he puts his foot on the Mount of Olives, and then Matthew chapter 25, the judgment of the nations take place. So, oh, by the way, this is not a parable. When he talked about the 10 virgins, that was a parable. He said the kingdom of heaven is like when he talked about the talents, he said the kingdom of heaven is like. Look at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and with all his holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Listen what Jesus says. This is what blows my mind. How do you spiritualize that? Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, he's coming back. And I, I think I mentioned last week, hey, I got really disturbed when I found out I'm in a church all those years and no one told me Jesus is coming back. That's a drag. I think one of the first things we should tell people, Jesus is coming back. Let people know he's coming. So he says, listen, man, when he comes, when he comes and he, he comes in his glory, he says and sits on his throne that the fact that he's coming at the end of the tribulation period. So again, here's these passages, Daniel chapter 7, chapter 9, chapter 12, Matthew chapter 25, Revelation. He's coming at the end of the tribulation period and I want you to understand that. And he comes and he sits on his throne. And he's set up as king of kings and lord of lords. And here's what I love, man. Jesus used that, that, that whole idea of son of man. And Matthew, throughout his gospel, has emphasized that Jesus is king. We started this whole thing with, with our emblems that are behind us, from the crown to the cross. And Matthew has taken us on that journey. And now, I want you to remember something. When Jesus said these words, where was he? On the Mount of Olives. Who's he with? The boys. Right? They're hanging out. Don't ever forget that. This wasn't some theological class. They're hanging out, and what is Jesus doing? He's answering that question. Jesus, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. He's still answering that question. And they're sitting there, so kind of keep that in mind. But how about keep this in mind also? Jesus knows in just a few days he's gonna be hanging on a cross. And he knows all 12 of those guys are gonna disappear. He's gonna be alone. And it's probably gonna be, you know, humanly speaking, a horrible time. Maybe his worst time ever. But I want you to notice what he's focusing on. He's not focusing on that. He's focusing on the fact, I'm coming back. And when I come, I'll come in my glory. And I'm gonna bring my holy angels with me. And I'm gonna sit on my throne. I am king. 
and I'm gonna come back and sit on my throne. You know, when I think about sitting on his throne, where is his throne? Jerusalem. Why is it, why do I say Jerusalem? Luke chapter two, an angel visited his mother and she said, he will sit on the throne of his father, David. Where's David's throne? Jerusalem. So he says, man, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna rule and reign from Jerusalem. Now, hey, that's pretty intense, right? And he says, hey, he says, when he comes back in all of his glory, verse 32, and all the nations will be gathered before him. So all the nations, so we could even translate this this way and it might be a little bit better. All the people, when he says all the nations, it's ethnos, it's all the people, everybody. Listen, when he gets on his throne, there's no hiding. Who's ever alive is gonna come. Now, they're gonna be gathered before him. And he's going to judge them. He's going he's to bring them. He's going to judge them. It says they're going to be gathered before him. And he will separate them one from the other as a shepherd divides his sheep from his goats. And he will set the sheep on his right but, hand, and, but the goats on his left. So you've got two entities. You've got sheep and you've got goats. I want you to pay attention to something. When they come to him... They're already sheep and goats. He doesn't make them sheep and goats. Remember, they are what they are. And you are what you are. So Jesus is coming because here's the thing. People get mixed up here and start, start uh, teaching this for a work salvation. This is not about works. You're either a sheep or you're a goat. I always like to say this. You know what the difference between sheep and goats are? Sheep go ba, goats butt. So if you're always button, if you're always somebody going, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, you better be careful. So that's just my theory. But listen, they come, he's going to judge them. Again, 2 Thessalonians chapter one talks about that he's coming and he's going to judge all of those who don't obey. So he's coming in judgment. You can go back and read Matthew 24 again. He's coming in judgment. Now we don't like that. In, in our world, we don't like the whole idea of judgment. We like to push that off and say, hey, that can't be good. R.C. Sproul said this. He says, we live in a world and in a nation that believes in salvation by death. Kind of interesting, huh? All you have to do to go to heaven is die. Now, we kind of owe that, but how, hey, isn't that true? Don't we live in a, in a world that does that? How many times do people say, they never talk about that person's relationship with Jesus. They just go, well, they died, they must be in heaven. And that's the world because we don't like judgment. Listen carefully, Jesus is gonna judge and he is gonna separate. So he's bringing all of these nations, the sheep and the goats, the sheep are on his right, the goats are on his left and now he's getting ready to judge them. And here's what I want you to understand as we get into this. If this is at the end of the tribulation, which I believe it has to be, you need to think about, you need to think about what we're about to read. Because if people did the things that he's talking about, they didn't do them out of a, 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 a time of, of uh, great wealth. They, didn't, they weren't affluent people. Hey, you need to understand, man, if people did stuff, they gave out of the nothing that they had. Because if you're a believer in the tribulation and you don't take the mark, you got nothing. It's a miracle if you make it to the end. You don't have things. So keep that in mind. And here's what Jesus says about the sheep. Listen to what he says. He says in verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now I want you to underline, man, if you're a Bible marker, here's what I want you to underline. Inherit. Don't, he didn't say come and get your wages or come and get what you deserve. He says, come to your inheritance. Who inherits things? Offspring, right? And some of you go, that's a trick question. You're just trying to trick me. Offspring, children, they, they're the inheritance. Hey, here's what he's saying. You're, inher you're inheriting this. You didn't earn this. You're inheriting this. So come, I love that whole idea, man. Come, why? Because you're sheep. They didn't become sheep by what they did. They were sheep and they did what sheep do. 
The goats didn't become goats by what they did. They were goats, and they did what goats do. Keep that in mind. So here's what he says, man. You come, come to your inheritance, and I love this whole idea, prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I kind of like that idea. And then we get into the lengthy part, verse 35 through 40. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. And I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. And I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me and I was in prison and you came to me. Listen, Jesus, and they say, then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And then he says, and the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you have done, did this to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. This is not, listen carefully, listen hard. This is not teaching that we have to go and feed the sick. I, I visit the sick and feed the poor and clothe the naked and go do all those things to get into heaven. That's not what this is teaching. Keith Green, sorry, I had to throw that out there. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you are going, who's he talking to? <laughs> Keith, are you here today? Stand up. But so if you don't know, Google. But this is not teaching that. Here's what this is teaching. Sheep do what sheep do. Saints, you don't become good by doing good works. You do good works because you are good because you're already changed. And don't go away from this passage, getting into the mentality, here's what I need to do to get into heaven. Here's what you must do to get into heaven. Believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and took your sins upon him and suffered what you were owed and, and what you needed and he took that and now he offers you a gift. But sheep do what sheep do, and I want us to understand that. Jesus didn't bring in a whole bunch of weird animals, and then because they did it, now you're a sheep, and because they didn't do it, now you're a goat. No, they did what they did because that was their nature. Now, hey, Jesus is saying some stuff, and here's again, I want you to think about these people gave out of their poverty. Imagine being in the, hey, again, read Revelation. Read what happens. Imagine at that time being generous. Like it's easy for us, I think, most of us, to be generous right now. But what about when you got nothing? What about when you got two crackers? You can give one to that guy because he needs it. What about visiting the sick? Hey, if I come out and visit the sick, I might get killed because I don't have the mark. And I am now a marked man because I don't have the mark. And I'm gonna come out and visit the sick or how about going to see people who are already imprisoned for their faith? You're gonna go do that when you know pretty much you go visit them, you're gonna get imprisoned? You see, that's what was going on. So some pretty intense things. And hey, what drives a person to do that kind of stuff is the spirit of God alive in them, moving them to do it. Not some social gospel that we have to go fix the world. We're never gonna fix the world. Now, having said that, I think we should feed the hungry. I think we should close the naked. I think we should be doing those things, but they should be an outwork of who we are, not to get into heaven. We should not do those things. Good, I did that, now I get into heaven. So Jesus judged them. He says, hey, man, come, and, and uh, he says, you know what? You guys come and, uh, and enter my kingdom. That's kind of cool, huh? So those are the guys going into the millennial kingdom. They're gonna, they're gonna live during that time. And then verse 41 comes the hard part. Verse 41, he says, then he will say to those on his left hand, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Now does that, does that verse like freak you out a little bit? Freaks me out. Depart from me? Wow. It's intense. Depart from me, you cursed. See, they're already cursed before they get to him. 
And then he says, listen, he says, depart from me, you curse. And he says, and uh, you, you curse into the everlasting fire. Listen carefully, prepared for the devil and his angels. This place, we kind of throw the word hell around kind of loosely. Hell, technically, hell in, in the Old Testament is Sheol, the place of the dead. What, what we generally think of, and when we use that term, unless you're cursing, but when you use that term, you're generally thinking of what he's calling here the lake of fire, the eternal lake of fire, the final judgment of everyone. And here's the interesting thing. Jesus just let us know something. That lake of fire wasn't created for punishment for man. The lake of fire was created to punish the devil and his angels. And men choose to go there by choosing to reject Jesus Christ. So these have rejected, and here's proof of their rejection. Listen, he says, here's where you're gonna go. Verse 42, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not take me in. Naked and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will uh, answer them saying, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do, uh, do it to one of these, uh, one of uh, these, the least of these, you did not do it to me. Wow. Now here's what I find fascinating is the goats didn't even know they were goats. Here's what they said, when did we do that? Just like the believers, when did we do that? Why, because if you're a believer, you're just living life and you're just doing it. You don't do it to get credit, you do it because of who you are. It just comes out of that relationship with Jesus Christ. And it just happens and Jesus goes, hey, you did this for me and you go, when did I do that? I think, of the, I think of the passage in Luke. Remember, he did, Jesus gives a parable of the, of the master and the slave, and the slave comes in. He just does what he's supposed to do. Hey, when he's done, he doesn't say, oh, I get a big reward, I waited on you. No, that's what I'm supposed to do. And as believers, you just do it, and you're shocked that you did it, but here's the flip side of it. As unbelievers, you're shocked that you're getting judged for not doing it because you don't know you didn't do it. And you're going, when didn't we do that? Well, because you not really who you said you were. Here's what, here's what blows my mind about chapter 25. Whether we're talking about the 10 virgins, if you were here last week, or the talents, or the sheep and the goats, have you caught on to the theme that's going on? Judgment came to those who committed sins of omission. In other words, they got judged for what they didn't do, not for what they did, but for what they didn't do and what they left out. That's kind of interesting because, you know, generally I think when we think of people getting judged, we think of murderers, rapists, those really bad people, right? I had a good friend that ended up in jail one time and he needed to be in jail, but he ended up in jail and, and, and he calls me and he goes, dude, there's bad people in here. And I go, really? In jail, imagine that. And that's kind of this thing. Listen, <laughs> this is this thing. Hey, people are, we always think that only bad, bad people go to hell. Here's what Jesus said. All three of these, I think, represent people who are under the pretense that they're okay. And they're not. It's not the things you do. It's not how many times you go to church. It's not how, how lengthy your prayers are. It's not how many times you read your Bible. It's not how many times you go on the corner and give that guy some food or how many times. You, here's the only way you're getting to heaven is by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it breaks my heart when I think about, I sit here and I look out there and I know, hey, I know there's some of you that do not have a, a real relationship with Jesus Christ, but you think you're okay. And that's what Jesus is addressing here. Hey, the goats were shocked. Listen, they didn't come to that and go, hey, we know we didn't do that. When did we do those things? We thought we were okay. We thought we were doing the right thing. Wow. And Jesus says, hey, do you guys depart from me? He said it earlier. And then verse 46. And these, the ones he's talking to, will go away to everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. 
That's pretty intense. He talks here about everlasting punishment and then the translators say eternal life. You need to know something. The word used for everlasting and eternal are the same exact word. It's just the way the translators translated it. He's talking about eternity. There is this thing called eternity and you are going to spend it somewhere. You're either gonna spend eternity with Jesus or you're gonna spend it without Jesus. It's one or the other. And it bothers me now, listen, hey, there's a big push right now. Let's just, let's just say, you know what? Let's say that eternity, you know, that hell doesn't last forever. It's only for a while. Well, you know, part of me in my mind, I think, well, for a while doesn't make it any better. But that's bogus. And I think when we do that, we wanna soothe our conscience because we're not really reaching out to people who we need to be reaching out to. So we wanna make ourselves feel a little bit better that they're only gonna suffer for 2,000 years or 2 million or whatever. No, those who go to that lake of fire, it's forever. Here's what I believe. There's a final resurrection. We will be raptured then those in the millennium, at the end of the millennium, uh, will, those who died will be uh, joined with the Lord. And we get indestructible bodies. Once we're glorified, we get indestructible bodies. That's kind of cool, huh? But do you know that people on the other side get indestructible bodies? But they're gonna wanna die, and they can't. And I think we've kind of lightened that up. I want to read a couple quotes. This is from J.C. Ryle. This is a really, really, really old dead guy. He's been gone for a long time. Listen to what he said. The state of things after judgment is chainless, changeless and without end. The misery of the lost and the blessedness of the saved are both alike. They're forever. Wow. That should bother us. John MacArthur says this. Jesus is speaking of eternal separation from God and from his goodness, his righteousness, his truth, his joy, his peace, and every other good thing. He is speaking of an eternal association with the devil and his angels in a place of torment God prepared for them. He is speaking of eternal isolation where there will be no fellowship, no consolation, no encouragement, and he's speaking of an eternal duration of an eternal affliction from which there will be no relief or respite. That's intense when you read it that way, right? And it should scare us. And man, I want us to be people who we're trying to save people from that. I don't wanna see anybody. Man, I read that and it sends chills down my spine and it scares me. And it even scares me more when I think people sit in church week after week after week after week and here's what they hear. Blah, 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 blah. I've had family members, I can just share this. I've had some of my family members come. Most of my family's not saved. I think Gaynell is, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> She's not here. <laughs> no. I just had to say that. I love her. Honey, if you're watching, I love you. Gaynell is saved and a couple of our but most of our family's not saved and they'll come occasionally you know what they always say to me going out because hey they know me you know what they say to me man you are long winded <laughs> you're long winded listen to this because it's because it means nothing to them they're dead and some of you sitting here right now are saying amen to that if you're dead inside you're dead inside you need to be made alive. I want everybody to be a sheep. I don't, I don't want any goats. I want a whole bunch of sheep. You know, and some people go, well, sheep bite. Well, I'd rather get bit by a sheep than butted by a goat. But hey, come on, let's be serious. If you're sitting here today and you do not have a relationship with Jesus, and you know that, do you think you're here by mistake? Pretty intense message. You need to make up your mind, man. You need to either get in or out. But be honest about it. Now, leaving on a little better note, praise God that we can be sheep. 
And that, listen, that Jesus is going to use us in this world to change this world. Hey, we're not going to go through the tribulation, I believe. But we can sure help people right now. And we don't need a social gospel. We need a real gospel that does social things. Let's stand up and pray. Father, I do thank you today, God, for your amazing grace. And even as we think about what we read and and the topics we looked at and, and putting everything together and then getting to this, to me, intense, massive passage that happens to people at the end of a, of a horrible time. And what a shock for those who think they're okay and they're not. And God, I pray for our ministry here that by your spirit, people are convicted they're not comfortable in their sin. I don't want someone to come to judgment and be shocked and say, well, that church never told me. We want to be a church that's open and honest and real. And so, God, I pray for those here today who don't know you. Touch them. Give them, give them that, that faith to come and to tell you, today, I want to be saved. And I know for some, that would be a hard thing. They've been around for a while. But Lord, don't let the enemy talk any of us out of being real and truthful and honest with you.